This video is brought to you by Morning Brew. Hi, welcome to another episode of Cold Fusion, where I cover anything in science, technology, business or history. During the dawn of the computing age, IBM was a technology giant. Once dubbed Big Blue, the scale of the company was massive at one stage, consisting of 60 to 70% of all business computers in circulation. But today, it's a completely different story. IBM was a major innovator. They invented the ATM, floppy disk, hard drive, magnetic strip card, and DRAM, to name a few. You may not also know that earlier this year, IBM, after over a century of operation, has now split into two companies. So the main question does have to be asked, why don't we all have IBM computers and smartphones today? What happened to IBM? This is the rise and stagnation of IBM. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. International Business Machines, or IBM for short, was founded in 1911. In this year, three companies, the Computing Scale Company, the Tabulating Machine Company, and the Time Recording Company merged. The products of IBM's early days were quite interesting. They included electronic tabulating machines and clocks that could record on punch cards when workers entered work, but also stranger products like meat and cheese slices. By the mid-1930s, IBM's electronic tabulating products helped companies deal with huge amounts of data. So soon, government began looking to IBM services. In 1937, the US government used the technology to keep the employment records of 26 million Americans. In a much less mundane and tragic use of the technology, the Nazis used IBM technology to keep track of Jews through a German IBM branch. When the horror of war was over, IBM would go from strength to strength. The company would introduce the world to the hard disk drive, the 305 Ramac. It stored a total of 5 megabytes, but it looked like this. Yes, it had to be moved with forklifts and transported by cargo planes. The data was stored on large spinning platters that retrieved the information with a magnetic arm. In the same year, the company would demonstrate the earliest practical form of artificial intelligence. Arthur L. Samuel of IBM's New York lab programmed an IBM 704 that could play checkers, but not only this, it could learn from its own experience. Sure, it was primitive, but it showed that it was possible for computers to learn. Before this, nobody knew if this was truly possible. In the 1960s, IBM partnered a lot with NASA, including the 1969 moon mission and the Apollo guidance computers. In 1964, IBM's innovation continued with the release of the IBM System 360. It was a family of mainframe computers whose product line had enough options for both large and small firms, as well as commercial and scientific applications. Some of the most powerful models could do 16.6 .6 million instructions per second and featured one megabyte of memory. The IBM 360 solved a problem that had begun to happen in the industry. See, when a company bought a new computer, they would use it till its capacity filled up. But the problem was, it was unupgradable. The company's only option was to get a bigger system. The issue was, all the software had to be rewritten because of incompatibilities. And this was expensive. So, IBM came up with a solution of making a family of computer where all the code worked between them, without any issues. It wasn't easy though. In researching for the system, IBM spent the equivalent of $40 billion, more than they made in an entire year. There were problems with production, and there was much infighting within the company. Many internally thought that this would be the end of IBM. Fortunately for them though, the IBM 360 became a smash hit, and it propelled IBM to become the world's largest computer company, and it single-handedly caused a steep rise in hardware sales. At this point, they were the only significant maker of computers, and had a strong monopoly in the market. Going even further with their influence over technology, the company also developed the computer language, Fortran. This language was the precursor to 700 programming languages that are used all over the globe today. Interestingly, 
Fortran, which is the world's oldest commercial programming language, is still being used by NASA scientists and others at the Department of Energy over 64 years after its inception. And here's why. According to Tom Kloon, who works at NASA, quote, Fortran has exceptionally good built-in support for numerical calculations and array manipulation, which is particularly important for scientists and engineers. Python and Java are generally perceived as being slower. With such a rich history at this point, you'd think that IBM would have gone on to dominate the PC market. I mean, today, everyone should have an IBM PC in their home and possibly an IBM smartphone in their hand. But obviously, this never happened. So what went wrong? Well, it all went south for IBM in the 1980s, just as the personal computing revolution was beginning to grow. With the release of the Apple II in 1977, computers went from a tool for business and governments to a very powerful tool for personal use. Overnight, whole industries were turned upside down. On the 12th of August, 1981, in a Manhattan hotel, IBM unveiled the company's entrance into this new industry. It was called the IBM PC. Welcome to the exciting new world of personal computers. As the new user of an IBM personal computer system, you now have one of the most powerful tools modern technology can provide. You'll learn how a microprocessor performs most of the same functions as a huge mainframe processor like those found in the big IBM type systems large corporations use. There are quite a few new keys on your IBM personal computer that make it different from an ordinary typewriter. At the time, the press didn't really see what all the fuss was about. But as it turned out, the personal computer would possibly be the biggest technology revolution in a century. When thinking about software for their new computer, IBM had two choices. A 24-year-old nobody called Bill Gates, who was recommended by a software engineer within IBM, or Gary Kildall, the president of Digital Research, the most well-known computer software company at the time. If you watched my special episode on the story, you would have seen how Gary blew off IBM in what would become known as the biggest business blunder of the century. I'll leave a link to it in the description. It's a fascinating story that actually impacted the entire technology world as we know it today. After the blunder, IBM would choose to partner with Bill Gates and his small company, Microsoft, would provide the software for the IBM PC. Unfortunately for IBM, they made a massive error and did not secure the rights to the software that Microsoft was going to make for their PC. In their mind, they didn't ever really think the PC was going to amount to much anyway. But as it turned out, loads of people wanted their own computer. At first, this was fine because the IBM PC would dominate in sales. The company predicted 200,000 units in the first year, but they were doing 200,000 units per month. In its first year, the IBM PC would generate $1 billion in revenue. And by 1984, the company was raking in $46 billion. But the glory wouldn't last for IBM. Seeing the dollar signs, soon other manufacturers would begin to make their own computers. And Microsoft was more than happy to sell their software to all of them. And this was when disaster began to strike for IBM. Why would anyone buy an IBM PC if they can get something that's cheaper and performs the same way? In an instant, IBM's competitive advantage was gone. Computer buyers began shopping elsewhere. To stop the downward trend, in 1987, IBM would put out their own operating system called OS2, and this was to combat Microsoft. But by this stage, Windows had already been out for two years. It was too little, too late. IBM had lost to the monster that they had created in Bill Gates. Their market share went from 80% in 1983 down to 20% in 1993. To make matters worse, between 1991 and 1993, the company made a net loss of $16 billion. IBM's operating system, OS2, didn't catch on and was eventually killed in 1995. The managerial controls within IBM reportedly broke down. Many parts of the company no longer delivered revenue to support the structure of the entire firm. Even a special dividend, which was usually reserved for widows and orphans pension funds, could no longer be sustained because of the financial decline. In this area of their history, IBM proved to be too slow in reacting to the flood of competition. 
As the 20th century drew to a close, computers were trending towards becoming smaller, faster, and more efficient. IBM's mainframes were fast becoming a thing of the past. Mainframes were replaced by small servers, and this crippled IBM. They were in no substantial position to cope with this change. However, in the supercomputing world, they were still market leaders. Perhaps as a marketing stunt to prove that they weren't completely dead at the time, IBM created Deep Blue, a primitive AI that defeated the reigning chess champion Garry Kasparov in 1997, a result that many experts were surprised at. Despite this, the downward trajectory was still happening. Although IBM's ThinkPad lines of laptops would be well received, it would all be too much and IBM's PC division was sold off to the Chinese company Lenovo in 2005 for $1.75 billion. The IBM giant had fallen. Reluctantly, IBM had to shift their business towards building networks and installing servers. So the question that you might be asking yourself in this stage of the video is, what on earth is IBM doing today? The new century for IBM was a checkered one. It could be summarized as doing a broad range of research and refocusing on their strength. In terms of research, the company actually holds the record for the most annual US patents, and this has been going for 28 consecutive years in a row. Some research of the 2000s includes carbon nanotube transistors, flexible transistors, and AI. Out of all of these emerging fields, quantum computing seems like IBM's best shot. In 2019, IBM unveiled the Q-System 1, the first circuit-based commercial quantum computer. IBM provides software that can build quantum circuits and test them on real quantum hardware remotely. Clients can then access the computer over the cloud. CERN, ExxonMobil, and Fermilab are among some of the clients that have signed up to use the system remotely. If you're a long-term subscriber, you'd remember how quantum computers take advantage of some amazing physical properties found in quantum mechanics. Through manipulating these unique properties, quantum computers one day will be able to do calculations that are impossible to run on devices today. I've got a video on the surprising future applications of quantum computing, so I'll leave a link below if you're interested. IBM has partnered with some Japanese companies, and they've already identified some promising use cases. Mitsubishi Chemical's research team has developed quantum algorithms capable of understanding the complex behavior of chemical compounds within OLED displays. A research paper by the scientists explains how this use of quantum computers could lead to more efficient displays requiring low power consumption. According to ZNet, researchers from Mitsubishi Financial Group have developed quantum algorithms that could speed up financial operations like Monte Carlo simulations. Optimized portfolio management and better risk analysis could result from this. So what about the competition in the quantum computing sector? What are some other companies doing? The following information is from the newsletter Morning Brew, who sponsored this section. Google is dropping a few billion dollars to try and build the first ever commercial grade quantum computer by 2029. It could solve complex problems, like creating a low CO2 fertilizer alternative millions of times faster than a conventional computer. Dario Gill, director of IBM Research, believes that 2023 is going to be an inflection point where the errors of quantum computers will continue to decrease exponentially because of software, as opposed to just the hardware. If you want to see more stories like this and many others, be sure to check out Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a free daily newsletter that comes in your inbox every Monday to Sunday. It gets you up to speed on business, finance, and tech news in just five minutes. It's completely free and takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Click the link in the description below to get started. Okay, so back to the video. Before we move to the last section, here are a couple of interesting facts about IBM. Interestingly, IBM chip technology made its way into the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 back in the 2000s. The company can also be accredited for creating the very first smartphone back in 1992, the IBM Simon. I've done a whole Cold Fusion episode on that one if you're interested. In 2001, the company was sued by Holocaust survivors for their technology being used in Nazi Germany. The suits were eventually dropped. During the 2008 financial crisis, most companies got smashed. In terms of share price, IBM fared significantly better than Hewlett-Packard, Cisco, Microsoft, and Oracle. 
The growth was ignited by global IT services, accounting for roughly $6 billion per year for IBM. Also providing numerous software solutions for both government and private industry proved to be very lucrative. In 2019, the company purchased Red Hat for a staggering $34 billion. Red Hat provides cloud storage, operating system platforms, and even consulting services. This acquisition was IBM's big bet on cloud computing. Industry observers noted that IBM is late to the cloud computing party, and it's obvious that they're playing catch up with these emerging technologies. They have stiff competition with the likes of Oracle, Google, and Amazon. In October of 2020, after over a century of operation, IBM broke into two. The old IBM will now be known as Kindrel, and it's going to manage the legacy services of IT infrastructure. The new IBM will use the Red Hat acquisition as a basis to build and focus on cloud computing and AI. Will it work? Who knows? So there you go. That's the story of one of the oldest computing companies in the entire globe. Even though they're trying to get their fingers in a lot of pies, currently, it's clear to see that IBM are no longer the innovators that they once were. So what are your thoughts? Will they ever catch up to the modern players such as Amazon, Google, or Oracle? Time will tell if IBM will ever rise again, but it's unlikely that we'll ever see them dominate 80% of any market like they did in the early 1980s. Anyways, that's about it from me. Thanks for watching the whole way through. My name is Dagogo, and I'll see you again soon for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one. Cold fusion. It's new thinking.